OK, now we, now we get to move on to the meat of today. We're going to talk about non-blocking caches, also known as out-of-order memory systems, also known as lockup-free caches. So I think the first paper that actually published on this called a lockup-free cache. Lots of people call these things non-blocking caches today. Um, and if you think about it from a memory perspective, it's an out-of-order memory system. What does uh, non-blocking cache allow you to do? Well, it enables you to have subsequent memory operations occurring from the main processor pipeline even when you have a miss that was earlier in your instruction sequence. So in all pipelines we've looked at up to this point, you take it, even our out-of-order pipelines, um, we were talked about them as basically saying, when you take a cache miss, you just sort of stop the pipe. Because we couldn't deal with having memory coming out of order, even to our out-of-order processor pipelines. We didn't have enough bits to track all that. Well, now we're going to talk about structures that allow us to track out-of-order memory. So two major things this allows you to do. It allows you to have a cache hit under a miss. And it allows you to have a miss under a miss. So what do I mean by miss under a miss? Well, what I mean by miss under a miss is you do an access, like say a load, it's to some address, it takes a cache miss. And then you have a load, a secondary, but you, you keep executing your program. And you do another load, and that takes a cache miss also. And you're able to process both these things if you have a, a, a non-blocking cache, which allows you to have miss under miss. <coughs> One of the big points I want to get across today is that this is not only for out-of-order processors. We talked a lot about out-of-order processors. Believe it or not, you can actually hook up a non-blocking cache to an in-order processor, or even a VLIW in-order processor. Now, how do you go about doing that? Well, two, two major ways that you can do that. Um, one is when you take the cache miss, you mark the variable, or you mark the register as not being there. So when you go to actually read the data, you block. So we'll show an example of that in, in uh, a few slides up from now. But really what I was trying to get across here is you can have in-order processors with out-of-order memory systems, and you can have out-of-order processors with out-of-order memory systems. Both these things are, are possible. OK, so challenge list. A um, couple, couple big challenges here. There we go. A couple big challenges. Um, if you have multiple out of order misses, well, the memory system is going to return data sort of out of order. You have to deal with this somehow. It's possible you might end up in a different memory bank and the data comes back in different orders that you sent it out in. And this gets hard to deal with. You, you sent out a cache miss for x, y, and z, and they come back in z, y, and x order or something like that. And you need to make sure you're delivering the right data to the right location in the cache and the right data to the right instruction. So we're going to need some big associative table to go figure this out. <clears throat> Second problem, major challenge here, is lots of times you're going to have a load and a store to the address that you want to take a load and store miss to later. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's pretty po common that you are going to be doing loads sequentially through memory. And if the first load in the cache line misses, the second load's also going to miss, but they're on the same cache line. You don't want to send two of those out to the memory system at the same time, because you might confuse the memory system. Worse, let's say if you have a load to one address and a store to another address, but they're both within the same cache line, the load might go out to memory, start getting the new memory. You do the store, the store goes out to memory, and you actually store in the main memory somehow, but you bring in the original load data, and they sort of pass in, the, in, in transit or something like that. The, the load data passes the store data, and all of a sudden, you're going to have the wrong data in your cache. You don't have the, the updated data. And the reason that that ends up happening is because the store didn't have any place to merge into. It couldn't actually go deposit its data into the cache, for instance. OK, so how do we go about handling this? Uh, well, before we do that, let's, let's look at a, a timeline here. Time goes from left to right on this graph. <clears throat> at the top here, we have a blocking cache. The blocking cache, you're happily running in the CPU. You do a load, we'll say, or a store. 
doesn't really matter in, in these systems. And you take a cache miss, and the most basic blocking cache, you're going to wait and wait for the cache line to get filled in. And then you can return the data, and then you can keep running the CPU. There's no overlap happening here. But we want to go fast. We want to go faster. If we have a non-blocking cache, we can take a hit under a miss. So what that means is we're running along, and we take a cache miss. This goes out to main memory, but we don't stop the CPU from executing. So let's say it is a, uh, a load for register 5. Well, as long as no one looks at register 5, does the processor care that we took a cache miss to register 5? Probably not. Now, there might be some complexities around if that load to register 5 takes a trap or something like that, or takes an interrupt. Then it might care, but let's say it doesn't. For, for, for the, uh, one of the reasons that this is actually usually safe to do is that you've already done all the memory checks and you've done, you're sort of past the commit point at that point of the processor. Because you're already pretty late in the processor pipe by the time you know you get a cache miss. So it's not too harmful. But then you keep executing here and you take, um, you access your cache again, you do a different load, and you get a hit. That's great. You can just keep executing. And it's only when you go to use the data do you stall. And effectively, we've, exec we've overlapped computation with our miss penalty. And this, this, is, this is pretty nice. Now, something else we can do is we can do misses under misses. So a miss under miss, we're executing along here. We take cache miss, and we send out uh, something out to the main memory system to go get the data. But we don't stop executing. We keep executing. We take another miss. And we send that out to the main memory system. At some point, maybe we actually go to look at the data. Or possibly, maybe we don't actually look at the data until here, and the CPU just keeps executing the whole time. It overlaps multiple memory accesses with computation. So this can be really powerful. And you can do this, as I said, with uh, in-order processor. Um, one thing I do want to say is, Usually, you have a limited number of outstanding memory accesses. Some small integer, maybe like four or eight. There's diminishing returns as you add more and more. Uh, but usually, you, you, this isn't sort of uh, thousands of outstanding memory accesses. So let's, let's look at this, the structure here. <clears throat> There's a couple different names for this thing. Um, it depends what school of computer architecture design you come from. If you are from the Alpha or the Digital Equipment Corporation design philosophy, you're going to call this thing a misaddress file. If you come from the Intel school of things, you're going to call this a misstatus handling register. Um, misstatus handling register actually predates Intel and uh, uh, goes back to, I believe, uh, Control Data Corp. Uh, there's, there's a paper from Control Data Corp on misstatus handling registers back in the like, out of the late 60s, early 70s. <clears throat> but let's look in, in, inside of this thing and, and sort of understand what's, what's going on here. You're going to have some small number of miss status handling registers, probably in a register file. And you're going to have a valid bit. And you're going to have a block address. Now, this block address is not the address of the load or the store. It's the address of the load of the store. Uh, it's the address of the cache line that aligns to that load in the store. Because what we're going to use this structure for is we're going to use this to check subsequent memory accesses or subsequent misses against previous ones that have been going on. And we may, may have multiple sort of uh, uh, in flight here. We don't actually need the address of the, the load or the store. We need the address of the entire line. Because we need to check the entire line. Because <clears throat> that's what's in play. We have a bit here that says whether it's issued or not. Now, why, why we have that is just because you took a miss doesn't mean it's actually out of the memory system or going to the memory system yet. So you sort of fill this in, and it sits around there until you have some time to go talk to the main memory. And hopefully, that happens quickly. Some architectures, that you may not even need this, because you might just stall until it actually goes out to main memory. But once it's issued, you, you tick that bit. And, and 
what this, what this allows you to do is it allows you to have multiple misses which are not issued. So if you have a miss under a miss under a miss and they happen really quickly, you can fill up this table quickly and not actually have to wait for it to stream out to main memory or all the requests out to main memory yet. So that's, that's half of it. And then we have a bunch of load store entries. And with these load store entries, they also have a valid bit. And they have a pointer back to one of these entries here. So this just is a number which says sort of which entry you're in in the miss status handling register file. <clears throat> and this is for individual loads or stores that are occurring. So what it allows, allows you to happen is let's say you have a load miss to address 0. And you have a load miss to address, uh, I don't know, 10. And these both are in the same cache line. You can fill in this table with two entries. And they'll actually both point back to the same miss status handling register location. They'll have different offsets. And then the destination field, you'll, figure, you'll fill in which register on the processor they're destined for. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these tables such that when a load comes back, or excuse me, when a cache line comes back from main memory, we'll be able to check in these two tables and do two things. One, we'll be able to fill it into our cache somewhere. And two, we'll be able to return the data to the correct destinations. And we'll be able to find which piece of data we need, given the offset in the cache line. Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a mouthful to say. So this, this is a little bit of a complicated data structure here to actually uh, uh, work out. Now, I wanted to point out where the associativity, uh, associative matches versus um, indexed matches happen in these tables. So one of the, the things that you might notice is that this block address, we're going to have to check every subsequent miss against this block address. So we're going to take the high, higher order bits of the address, check it against this. And if it checks that, we don't add a new entry here. Instead, we just merge it into a currently pending one. But we do have to add a new load store entry for that, which points back over here. <clears throat> when a memory transaction comes back from main memory, we're going to look back in this table and say, oh, here's the one that I, I had issued. I need to clear it out of the table. And given the number of the location that I'm clearing out of the table, I'm going to associatively check that against all of the load store entries and wake up the ones that match. So if this is entry number one, and there's multiple number ones in here, all the ones that are, have number ones in here, I need to return that data to the registers. Now, when I return the data to the register, I have to mark the register as being available again. <clears throat> and the type here basically just says, you know, is it word, half word, bytes, and is it a load versus a store? One other thing I wanted to say is the destination here for loads is going to be the register identifier. Now, this might be a physical register identifier versus a virtual register identifier or an architectural register identifier if you have a registry namer. So if you have an out-of-order processor here, this, this might get more complicated. This is typically a physical register identifier, not a architectural register identifier. For stores, you also effectively need to track something in this table because you need to merge the store with the background data. So this is going to basically add an entry in here. It's going to send out to main memory, go get the background data. And when that comes back, it's going to deposit that into our cache. <clears throat> and we need to point at some other buffer. This is uh, very similar. We had that future store buffer. You can have an array of those, for instance. And it'll tell you which one to go play the store against our cache with. And you can merge the return data with the, the store data that we've stored locally. So this is kind of fun. We can have memory coming back out of order. We can have memory being issued out of order. Lots of, lots of fun, fun uh, toys here. And one of the fun things we can do is we, we have an ability, because of this associative check here, to check to make sure that the data coming back or excuse me, subsequent requests 
hit or miss here and, and will merge so we don't have to generate more memory traffic or cause strange things happening where you have re responses coming back and new requests going out for the same line and you might uh, lose some data in flight. I should point out this is only one implementation. Um, lots of times what, what people do is in, in this misstatus handling register there will actually be a tag field because main memory will not necessarily keep track of the entire address when you get a response back from main memory. Instead, it'll just have a tag. So instead of checking against the block address, you might check against a smaller tag. Um, that's one way that people sort of get a, uh, make this a little bit easier. Another way that sometimes people do this is the tag, if you have a small number of cores, might actually be which entry you are in this table, so you don't have to do an associative check. That's sort of a, a optimization on this. You still need to do an associative check when future loads and stores that miss uh, go out to memory, because you need to check in this table. I think I, I think I walked through most of this already. Um, on cache miss, you have to check the table for the match address. If found, you allocate uh, uh, a new entry that points to the misstatus handling register. If not, you have to make both a load, en load store entry and a misstatus handling register entry. Um, one thing I did want to point out here is if you run out of misstatus handling registers or load store entries, it's not the end of the world. You could just stop the processor. So if you have, let's say, eight of them and you run out of all eight, you have eight outstanding memory transactions, you just stop for a while. It's, it's going to come back at some point. You're in one of the loads or one of the main memory accesses is going to come back. So you can just stall for a little bit. On data return, you need to find the load and store that's waiting for it. Um, going back to what uh, Bertrand said, it's very possible that a, the load and store that was waiting on it might have actually disappeared in that time period, well, at least for a load, because you might have a write after a write occurs. That's OK. You still want to fill it into your cache at that point. And of course, you can have multiple loads and stores. <clears throat> um, when the cache line is completely returned and you've finished checking against all the load and store entries, you want to deallocate both the load and store entries and the mishdash handling register entries. OK, so a little bit of oops, fun here with in-order machines. So you can sort of see how this relatively logically fits into an out-of-order pipeline. If you want to fit this into an in-order pipeline, you can, um, it's not, not too hard. You can actually add a scoreboard for each individual register. And when I say scoreboard, you're not tr tracking where the data is coming from. Instead, there's a special bit saying, this register is out to launch. This register is out in the memory system. If you try to go access it, just wait or just stall. And then when the memory, because it's a variable length sort of thing, so your scoreboard can't have this will be ready in five cycles because you don't know. It's out in the memory, main memory system. On load miss here, um, you can mark the, you mark the destination register as busy when it comes back. You mark it as available and you uninstall the processor. But if no one actually went to go use that register, in the meantime, while it was out in main memory, the main processor never stalls and no one's ever the wiser. OK, so I wanted to, uh, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to uh, pick it up here for a second. So uh, non-blocking caches, um, they can effectively increase the bandwidth to your lower levels of caches, your sort of L1s. Uh, the other thing they can do is they can increase the bandwidth because they can merge misses to your cache. Now, you probably would have actually gotten that anyway if you had a blocking cache. But the misstash handling register basically uh, allows you to have multiple cache misses merge into one transaction. <clears throat> Your miss penalty is obviously lower because going back to this picture here, we've overlapped the miss penalty with other useful work. <clears throat> 